Rick Leong, thank you so much for participating in the exhibition. I'm absolutely thrilled we have your paintings in the show. Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to uh, be part of it. It's like a, uh, it's an amazing opportunity to engage in this kind of conversation with uh, other artists through their work. And I, I wish I could see it in person and walk through that space because that's when the, that kind of conversation really comes alive, right? Right. Indeed. I mean, as you were just saying, it's uh, so much about, you know, the quality of, of being alive and being, you know, uh, human interacting in the world is, is, is the direct experience and painting obviously is no exception. So I would love it if that would be at all possible for you to come and see the show and, and see your work in the space and, you know, be able to celebrate, you know, that kind of experience with us. But until then, we have this. <laughs> yeah, it's the time we live in, right? Um, and I think it's great that uh, even though I can't be there, and I don't know how many other artists in the show can't be there, but right. we're there in spirit through our work. Oh, man, that, that's it. You said it. <laughs> um, you know, speaking of the experience, I, I first encountered your work um, at the gallery in Montreal that was then called Parisian Laundry and that was that was in 2010. I went and looked back and okay. um, and I immediately even though I, I and I just looked at the work was I experienced a moment of kinship. Oh wow. Um, there was something about the curvature of your lines and the composition you know of the vegetation in these uh, landscape paintings that like felt familiar, even though it was something I'd never seen before and com and really contemporary. Um, but then I saw your surname and then I was like, oh, <laughs> instant rapport, <laughs> you know, being like, you know, half Chinese. And so I would love to know more about how it all started for you and perhaps the connection with the natural environment and how it's become so central. To your work? Well, I, that's, you know, that's a long and complicated answer. Yeah, I think uh, I didn't actually start making landscapes until I left this place and moved to Montreal to do my graduate uh, degree. And all of a sudden I, I found myself in the middle of the city, big city, and I started creating these landscapes to surround myself in. And wow. I wasn't totally sure why I was doing it until uh, I came visited back here and I was like, oh, this is the place that I'm, I'm painting. Um, and I realized that how important it is to have that connection to landscape uh, as a sense of um, grounding oneself, I think in many ways. And just that, um, to be able to use that landscape as a visual language to express my story, my life experience, my, my experience of being in the world, right? Um, particularly as a, you know, Chinese Canadian of mixed heritage, um, I was really interested in this idea of hybridization, right? I have a hybrid look. It's not just one, one thing or another. It's like a multitude of perspectives from a multitude of places. I moved around a lot as a child. So, um, it's not about just one landscape either. So it's, uh, I think, right from the beginning, I had this uh, sense of uh, needing to, uh, of wanting to, or seeing this need to incorporate place and landscape in the formation of my own sense of identity and working through that, what that means. And I, you know, I didn't necessarily have a strong sense of what that was but I explored it through these paintings uh, and the use of the landscape. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So um, the more I did it, like I, they, I, it, it kind of had two main sort of driving forces, right? One was rooted in this idea of place and the environment. Um, and the other was in this uh, um, stand from this uh, exploration of identity. Um, so, what that meant is that I was drawing from uh, multiple sources. Not only was I drawing from actual places that I had inhabited or explored or been to, 
but I was also pulling from Chinese iconography and visual culture and visual language. So I was looking at things like Cassie tapestries or religious paintings, but even in religious paintings and when there it was more about uh, the icon or um, a religious icon, I was very interested in how they contextualize them within those landscape forms, whether they're floating on clouds and nimbuses or surrounded by rainbows. Um, or, you know, what did it mean to when all these Taoist immortals were, you know, chose to live in the mountains mm -hmm. or, in, you know, on an island in the middle of the ocean? Um, I was fascinated by those kinds of things. I was like, what does that mean? They have all these meanings unfolded within them. And then you see those kinds of things reiterated in uh, craft patterns like ceramics and embroidery and uh, sculptures and carvings. It's in everything, right? So it's so it was so such a rich place to draw from and um, pull into that kind of visual language. And I've had this thing with uh, language where it's uh, it's not I feel like language isn't continually reinvented so much but it's, it's continually evolving it's evolving with how we want to use how we need to use it to communicate um, and it's full of like what you said nuance right uh, colored by our experiences of being in the world uh, and our experiences are so unique in many ways particularly for diaspora you know we I, I mean I can only speak for myself but um, you know when you're this place where you find yourself in another place you're continually looking for those those visual cues to inform what it means to be what you are right so uh um it just was i was able to express myself fully through the incorporation of all these different kinds of visual forms uh including uh ink painting right traditional sort of chinese and uh japanese and mm -hmm. uh Asian painting in general, but I was also interested in etymology. So etymology of language, right? I loved like, for example, abracadabra is so old it predates uh, recorded history. So we have a sense of what it means now, but that, that, that meaning has changed over thousands of years and its original meaning we don't totally know because the context is completely gone. So. That's the same with visual language in many cases. Uh, and I think a lot of it is rooted in, um, you know, it's rooted in the landscape. So uh, one of the earliest goddesses, uh, Chinese goddesses, was Magu, which would literally translates as hemp lady. So, you know, 10,000 years ago, thousands of years ago, uh, the thing that we worshipped was uh, an element of the landscape, it was hemp and we, person we personified it as a goddess and worshiped it. And that's, you can see that in many kinds of uh, um, gods and goddesses, such as the, the San Xing, the three star gods. Like, so gods can be the stars in the sky to um, the plants in the landscape and everything in between. Um, and when I'm making work, I'm, you know, I'm trying to be cognizant and aware of those things as I'm using them and incorporating them into these things. So in terms of symbology and iconography, so something like this, this work with the willow trees, it's to see a willow tree in an old growth forest, say, it's, there's, it, it's, it symbolizes this aspect of, uh, um, you know, one thing finding it, what the thing that doesn't I don't want to say doesn't belong but it's like this juxtaposition of these two things that come from two different places and I found that really uh really powerful um that and that happens you can go walk through the forest and birds will eat you know an apple seed somewhere and it'll be you know <laughs> apple tree in the middle of nowhere it's like how did this get here but it's the sa same kind of thing right that migration that spread that um that hybridization that occurs that creates a new kind of ecosystem, a new kind of harmony mm -hmm. within it. I feel like I've gone on a bit of a tangent there. Yeah, no, it's all <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah. Uh, going back to those forms, yeah, I think that that's where it all kind of stems from and comes from. It's mm -hmm. just kind of trying to incorporate that into my visual language and mm -hmm. uh, looking at those, those different sources, those different histories.
-hmm. and pulling it in. I read uh, something, uh, you know, in the in the in Tamer's essay that he wrote for our publication. It's a great it's a great piece about yeah, I loved um, it. sort of your early days uh, having like sci fi fantasy drawing sessions. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, with your, with your brother. Yeah, and uh, and I wanted to to know how that you know if if that experience at all was were, were part of like the formative years of your 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 interest and in investigation and like you know engaging the engaging your environment with your imagination. Um, I don't know as some kind of way to foreground your later explorations. I think so, because for me, like, I, I still love sci-fi. <laughs> I feel like now it's like I'm getting older and um, spending more time teaching. I, I'm reading more things like, uh, uh, like nonfiction stuff, mm -hmm. but I love fiction. <laughs> I love, like, for me, it's the, I'm really interested in this, the interplay between the subjective and the objective and that, that, that blurry line in between where, uh, like magical realism happens. Um, but I love sci-fi because, particularly growing up, because for me, it was all about pure imagination. Mm -hmm. um, we have no idea what the future holds, right? We just have to imagine what it's like. But in doing so, we're imagining that we have a future. So in, it's inherently utopic. I feel like utopia, I was going to say, I, I used to think that utopia existed solely in the future but I also think it can exist in the past through nostalgia. Mm -hmm. um, you know, things always seem a little rosier when you can edit. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so, I, you know, I think there's a strong sort of uh, uh, leaning towards these utopic places that I think uh, um, traditional Chinese painting is a large part of too, it contributes to, um, it's an idealized landscape. It, you know, you can be inspired by things in the, in the world, but it's really about that landscape of the imagination and it becomes idealized and it becomes this perfect kind of place. Um, and so I think that in many ways, I, I do, I think that my, the places that I paint, I, I have this thing where I, I want to be a positive sort of force in the world. I want to paint the the idealized version of things in which we can inhabit. And I think that's important to have those kinds of visions for ourselves, even though I do totally wholeheartedly believe that those visions will differ from person to person to person to person. And that's that's why it exists in the future. We're all contributing to this version of what that might mean. And it's constantly evolving. It's never set in stone, this utopic ideal, right? And I love this idea that I'm contributing to that by using landscape forms of the now and pulling from those historical art forms and uh, in, in history. Um, it's like diasporic identity, you know, sort of uh, to quote, you know, like Stuart Hall in, in that, um, you know, these are always in formation, like they're always in production. Um, they're, they're never fixed. It's so, mm -hmm. so the idea of like a, a utopian um, image is also like, as you say, it's, it's always changing. It's always in evolution. It's always sort of informed by, you know, what is being, what is being lived and, and also a critique of what is being lived. Mm -hmm. um, so I really, I really like that idea. And I also feel like the spaces that you're making in the landscapes are places where, where one wants to be. Like, I want to be, I feel like I'm there. Like I can be in that, in that, I can, in that picture looking in at this, um, uh, this, this flora and mm -hmm. I can, I can, you know, sort of sense the time, you know, the sort of the light, you know, is really evocative and, and that I can even smell, you know, Wow. what the the that that forest i mean that that's sort of uh, that's sort of how powerful you know painting can be um to to sort of pivot a little bit i also remarked in uh tamar's essay that you refer to yourself as hollow bamboo jokes okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you know like as a third generation like canadian of chinese heritage you know i, I think you 
I, I mean, I totally relate. I'm, I'm second generation. But, and I, when I was a kid, I was like, actually, absolutely horrified, you know, if, if someone within the Chinese community would kind of refer to me that way. Like, I took offense, even though, like, my father would be like, yeah, <laughs> you know, like, uh -huh. <laughs> and, and other friends I know have also felt a little bit, um, uh, you know, uh, have felt that it was a term that marginalized them within the Chinese community as well. How have you reconciled this? Or um, how did you become aware of your diaspora identity? Well, uh, I, I've been, I just uh, started studying Mandarin last year. I, I'm, I'm uh, Cantonese, but yes. uh, uh, I, uh, I teach at University of Victoria and they offer Mandarin classes. So I was like, I'm going to learn Mandarin. <laughs> How's it going? And, uh, <laughs> so I was always, you know, I was always grilling my, my, my instructors. Like, so what does this mean? And what does that mean in culture? And what does this uh, idiom mean? Or what is that? And, um, you know, we, we have this thing in Canada and North America, I guess, where we hyphenate. We're like a Chinese Canadian or, and this and that. And, She's like, they, they don't do that there. It's like you're, you, there's no word for Chinese Canadian. You, you say, they say it's, you're a Canadian of Chinese descent, which is a very, I think, important distinction that uh, um, uh, gives some insight into their thinking about Chinese diaspora mm -hmm. around the world, probably, you know what I mean? Like they're all, probably all think that they're all, all of bamboo in that way. Um, I think there's some interesting kind of conversations you can have around that because it, you know, on the one hand, it's sort of <clears throat> talking about identity as being linked to place and culture and language and less on genetics and your body and being in the world like in that way, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, who, who makes those delineations, right? Like who determines that? And I'm all for self-determination <laughs> and, I, I, and I'm okay with that. And I, I understand there's many things that I wasn't inculcated into and wasn't taught. And like, I, 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 I think I remember one word of Cantonese. <laughs> Which one? Oh, I, I, Doja, like for <laughs> yeah. I, I, I can count to ten. <laughs> the, yeah. Those really basic things are, um, you know, um, <clears throat> I probably know more Mandarin now than I know Cantonese. But uh, I, you know, they're all part of the conversation. Um, but I think it's also interesting in that uh, it's it kind of makes you realize, or made me realize that you know. When you're not claimed by other, I you're kind of this unique thing in the world, and that's okay. It's okay to be, to, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to be self-determinatory in that way, and and define what your identity is to you. Mm -hmm. And certainly, I, many people do that in different ways, and I feel very fortunate to be able to do that through art. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, um, it's it's the terrain of freedom, really, and and I think that's what um, you know. Ultimately, the uh, artistic pursuit is linked with is is a desire for freedom. Um, I, I know for myself that the reconciliation of sort of not being anything, you know, like mm -hmm. the feeling that you're not you're not Chinese or Filipino or Canadian, uh, at, at some point became like the self-defining moment, you know? I'm not any one of these things, I'm all of these things. They're, it's not really um, something that can be separated into quantifiable portions. And so that's what it is. And well, I'm gonna, you know, affirm that. Mm -hmm. uh, the future so is half. Of, you know, huh? The future is half. <laughs> <laughs> it is. We it is. become more global citizens is, you know, oh, yeah. migration and interaction. Yes. Yeah, it's definitely a plus. No yeah. doubt. <laughs> um, and that, and uh, also uh, in the essay, it's you know that uh, the the uh, revelation that uh, an awareness of your uh, you know your Chinese heritage um, and diaspora identity also came through uh, 
you know, your relationship with, with friends who are indigenous. Mm. Um, around sort of being misrecognized mm -hmm. as potentially as also indigenous. I mean, that's mm -hmm. happened, that happens to me too. And, and yeah. I'm just wondering like uh, how it was, how that was, uh, how that played out for you, that, that kind of, uh, you know, the realization that we all think we're the same until someone says, no, you're, you're different. Yeah. Uh, that goes both ways too, right? Like I think there was a, uh, an incident um, in Vancouver where an ind indigenous woman was mistaken for Chinese and was had this racist encounter around COVID. Um, and that was kind of eye-opening for me too. Like, oh yeah, it's like, oh, it, it goes both ways. <laughs> but um, it's those surface things. But growing up, uh, in terms of that, it's, I think uh, for me, it was uh, a sense of belonging. I felt, you know, there, there was kind of a sense of belonging, hanging out with people that looked like me. <laughs> Cause yeah. I've definitely been in situations where I was the only person of color in the, in the school, the classroom, the community even. And um, even in those instances, I was often mistaken for indigenous. I had long hair growing up from a kid to a teenager. And um, I, I don't know if that contributed to it or what, but uh, yeah, I think, I think any, any time that you are able to find any kind of community that is willing to accept you, it's, it's a good thing, right? And, you, and, it, and it, it helps uh, in terms of forming a sense of who you are, for sure. I think definitely need those kind of community interactions and bonds. Mm -hmm. um, in, your, in your bio statement, you, you described your work as having, you know, a, a bilingual vocabulary and style. Um, and it's interesting that you use a term in language, you know, to, to describe this hybridity or, you know, a synthesis. And then I remember the title of the next show I saw at Parisian Laundry like a couple of years later, and it was called Hybrid Vigor. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, Are you familiar maybe, with that? With that well, name? I would like you to, yeah, I would love for you to unpack that a little bit because hybridity as a, you know, as a strategy is really important to, I think, uh, uh, a kind of survival skill. And, mm. um, you know, it, and I would love to hear you more, you know, sort of discuss that in your approach. Yeah, for sure. So hybrid vigor, it happens in nature as in culture, <laughs> as in language, as in everything. Yeah. So um, uh, hybrid vigor is when two different, well, let's say two different life forms, let's say let's go into nature. Um, when say uh, fungus and, uh, and lichen and yeast two very separate life forms come together, they can create, oh, no, sorry, it's not lichen, it's, uh, it's bacteria and fungus and yeast, they come together and they make uh, lichen, many different kinds of lichen. Uh, it's like a, it's a trend, they transcend the sum of their parts, become something wholly new. And people have done this with husbandry, they, they you know, they, they, they breed animals to, have different features, uh, like pugs. I have a pug, <laughs> and you might hear him click clacking around the kitchen. Um, but I found it like I I love that as a metaphor because I one I I'm very you know invested in this idea of the landscape and using the landscape as a visual language, but it also relates very well to my experience being in the world by being a hybrid of many different things and pulling not only my, me, myself, being of mixed heritage, but uh, my use of pulling from many different sources to, to create my visual language. Mm. Um, yeah, the, the, the hybridity, you know, sort of the, the idea of hybridity has been, um, you know, used a lot in post-colonial theory, you know, like, Homi Baba, and uh, I guess to, to some degree as well, uh, um, Stuart Hall. But, you know, there's a, I really think that there's an interesting way, like an, uh, uh, an, an empowered way, you know, to, to look at um, the use of, of hybridity within, a, within um, 
I guess, visual culture in general. Mm -hmm. And it's something that you, you really interestingly bring into, in an uncanny way. And I'm not sure how aware you are of that um, because perhaps like you, I, the first paintings I saw when I was a kid were a group of seven paintings. And they have forever like created a kind of indelible image in my mind of a kind of Canadianness of which I feel I have complete entitlement to. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, that I guess that process, um, uh, how you come to, uh, you know, apply this to, you know, to the actual paint on, you know, on surface and, because there's an interesting, I, I always find there's an interesting alchemical um, um, kind of methodology or something that happens, basically. Something that happens in between the space of the imagination. Well, what comes in, what happens, and what comes out. And, you know, I, 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 I'm digging here because I haven't found any answers yeah. yet, to, you know, how you make paintings. <laughs> <laughs> like creative process. Yeah, I know. Just, um, just that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it it, it kind of comes from a, a very variety of ways, but it's like I I'm very invested in this kind of Taoist approach to painting, which is spontaneity uh, of being in that moment to be able to hold all those things in my mind, like a general idea of what it is that I'm going to paint, without being overly determinatory of what that's going to look like. Um, and the kinds of visual languages or the colors that I want to bring into it or how I'm feeling in that moment or how I was, how I was feeling in the landscape that I want to depict or the idea that I'm trying to illustrate in some way. I basically hold those in my mind and I just stand in front of a blank canvas and I work through those ideas and I uh, basically take an uh, Eastern approach to painting, which is very thin washes, building it up and pulling it out of the ether and locking it in towards the upper layers. But instead of doing ink on paper, I'm doing it on oil on linen or canvas on a really big scale. So um, what that does for me is that when I'm building it up through very thin layers, it allows me to have really rich saturated colors, like in really pure colors that are then thinned down without uh, muddying them by mixing them directly. But also because it just slowly comes out of the canvas and the textures that are laid down in the canvas, uh, there's this element of the gestalt where I have these things in my mind that I'm, I'm kind of working towards, but I'm also responding to what's going on on the canvas at the same time. So it's like a dialogue. It's like a back and forth. Um, and in that way, I, I, I feel like it's more, it holds this element of discovery for me in the making of it. And that for me is the, one of the most exciting elements. When, I, when I'm starting a new painting and I'm standing in front of something like eight feet, by six feet, like it just kind of embellishes my vision. And I can just start uh, that, I don't know, it's not like, like a dance, but like that, just that process of just working through my thoughts and ideas and seeing them appear and disappear and, you know, all those different stages. It's, uh, and just being responsive to that. And it's kind of like uh, being able to listen to, just to what's happening, like, kind of like what's going on. So, you know, something that's unintentional might spring up and could be really interesting. And then, you know, you fleshed out, it becomes more locked in. Um, and that's just that element of discovery again, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But for me, that process of engaging and making work in that way has that excitement each time because I don't know what it's going to look like. It's like, what's this going to look like? Yeah. And then um, seeing it come to life, uh, that's, for me, that's, that's the most exciting, is to, I call it finding my image, that, that stage. And then I spend, I could spend months refining. Like once I find my image, then I could spend months refining it, up to months, you know, it's a different, it depends. Mm -hmm. how it is. Mm -hmm. But you, you, you let that emerge, you let time um, unfold 
for for that image to come into being absolutely yeah 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 i'm a really i i i, I don't know if it seems like it from someone else's perspective but i'm a really slow painter i have no painters that just boom boom, boom execute and they're excellent paintings and it's just the way they work right they just they have this vision in their mind and they execute i just uh every time i work that way i just it just goes somewhere else <laughs> it just wants to be something else mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so there is this moment of kind of letting it be you know letting it be what it's going to be and having the patience to uh to let it uh rise up i mean it's a Particularly with uh, things with, that come from memory too, like um, bo both of those paintings that are in exhibition are rooted in this very, I, this rooted in places. Uh, one of them that I'm very familiar with, but it's just my impression of it. And, and you know, when you're working from memory in that way, you're not exactly sure, you know, how things look and they only become more clear as you're making them. Um, and still, even then, like, if I showed you a picture, you'd be like, that's not that place at all. But that, for me, it is that place, mm -hmm. you know? Exactly. You also often, uh, especially um, in the paintings that are in this show, work in a, quite a large format. Um, and it does give us uh, an immersion, you know, it gives us the sense of immersion, but it, and it's, and it's really human scale in the sense that I feel I can walk right into. Awesome. Where? <laughs> <laughs> I do. I, I think about that, um, you know, in terms of architecture and uh, figures in the landscape, I, I, you know, I played around with that, like if they, if they appear, they appear, but they don't appear often. And it's because I always imagined that the, the paintings themselves are always shown within the context of architecture. Right. So putting more architecture in there is, seems unnecessary. And then the viewer becomes the figure in the landscape. So, you know, I'm definitely trying to work in a scale where I can allow those things to happen. Um, mm -hmm. that I, I love that you, you they, they're working for you in the way that I imagine them to work. Oh, in, cool. In well, that. I mean, yeah, because you're really just, you, you sort of, in your own mind's eye while you're watching them you're almost seeing yourself in the painting you know what i mean like you're seeing yourself as the kind of i don't know uh like a like a privileged lone observer <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what it feels like to be in those places sometimes in some of those landscapes but it's also it's it's also kind of where how else can you invite someone into the landscape of your imagination, of your memory, of your projection of utopian futures. I mean, the the other thing about Goldstream and Wild Willow is is that you explore the color blue with so with such like immense complexity and an and, a, and an incredible play of light. Um, so I was wondering if we could talk more in depth to, about each of those works um so maybe if we could start with uh with goldstream okay yeah this forest scene with this kind of luscious stream flowing and it's like the water's dancing over rocks and things and and i'm my own uh, familiarity with uh with chinese painting is is immediately engaged sort mm -hmm. of and also with having been in in chinese gardens as well you know how they're all very laid out how all the elements uh play out in harmony and in balance, and that yet this is a wild place, right? Mm -hmm. That that uh, that you're showing, and yet there are elements of that. I yeah. like to speak. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good observation because it is a park. It's a national park, a provincial park, uh, but it's old growth. It's wild. It's uh, it's quite old grown. It's a uh, jungly almost, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's like cool and temperate. Um, moss dripping from every tree and it's actually there's the gold stream is uh famous for this hundred foot waterfall uh which is obscured by that bend and then the river so that kind of wash of white that kind of comes through the trees in the back that's that's where the waterfall is and then it's kind of flowing around the bend mm -hmm. um, and it's also a salmon run so 
uh, certain times of the year, every tree will just be filled with bald eagles uh, feeding on the pink salmon. Um, and it's just chaos everywhere. Um, so it's quite a striking place that I visit, um, you know, often um, at different times of the year, it has different kinds of characteristics. Like uh, in the summertime now, that, that river is dry. If there's the waterfall still falling, but I think the water flows under the rocks for the most part. Um, but in the winter, it's like a, you know, it's a, it's a full on river. So um, there's that characteristic around it. I try to, one of the things that I like to do with painting because I'm able to is to conflate time and space in that way. Yes. Um, so it's a, a, a conflation of all those different kinds of experiences at different times throughout the year. Mm -hmm, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I want to get back to that, like this conflation of the time of day but let's talk for a second about Wild Willow because when, when I first saw those works, you know, the, the, the first thing that occurred to me was, was how, how this blue had so many multiple overlapping references. Um, you know, I, I was thinking about um, definitely like Chinese, Chinese porcelain, um, also blue willow which is like the like the british chinoiserie pattern for dishware mm -hmm. that my mother happens to have a huge oh, yeah. you know? <laughs> <laughs> and then we talk about it and she's like oh <laughs> you, you grew up with it yes i mean it's a it's an it's an actual um it's like a it's like a family uh it's got a strange ambivalent place, I guess, it, because on the one hand, it is, you know, quite fun to look at. It's quite beautiful to look at. And then also because of its, you know, it's sort of colonialist um, baggage. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it, it, it's, so there's, yeah, so there's all of this going on with it. So you don't want to completely throw it out. And yet at the same time, you know, um, we can, we can, um, be critical and question these things and have a good conversation about it. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, there's a, so there's an homage to all kinds of, of um, hybridities or, or I guess histories and their overlappings that I, that I see um, when I think about uh, historical power dynamics in the work. And then also the, the centrality of, of the willow tree and its um, majesticness, you know, sort of the, the way that you give it, um, I think how Tamar described it is the ethereal, you know, you invest it ethereally with the blue. Yeah, talk to me about yeah, that. <laughs> um, well, I, let's start with the, yeah, let's start with, the willow pattern. <clears throat> that kind of what's precipitated that, that body of work. And I, I'm fascinated with this idea of chinoiserie because chinoiserie is how others view, it's like looking through a different lens and how they see us, right? Mm -hmm. So it, uh, I always find that interesting, like, you know, because uh, on the one hand, it plays into many kinds of stereotypes um, and perpetuates them, but on the other hand, it's a fascinating look into, you know, what their, <laughs> what their perspective is. Um, particularly as colonialists, like Hong Kong, as you know, was colonized by the English as well as Canada. <laughs> um, and then, you know, they do, they have this thing where they incorporate elements of their colonies into the formation of their own identity. So that English, that willow pattern is, Whereas it is, you know, begins in, in China um, with uh, traditional blue and white ceramics and it was co-opted and appropriated, it, they really do think of it as representing them as in terms of identity, uh, not only for themselves in, in England, but, you know, around the world. You'll, you'll see that it's very ubiquitous, that willow pattern. In terms of industry, even, it, and, and, uh, and, it just kind of being everywhere. Um, 
So I was really interested in kind of like taking ownership back over something like that, even though like they, I think they wrote a story, it like illustrates a story of love. Or, it, it's a story that they made up to sell the work. And it's like, well, you know, I'm not so much interested in that story, but I'm interested in the story of how these things came to be. How, you know, right from, you know, where cobalt originally came from, um, Middle East, you know, how, you know, how the connections through the Silk Road and through trade um, and commissioning uh, Chinese artisans to create patterns on ceramics for them. And then how that, you know, was again, uh, co-opted through trade and um, industry to another place uh, and used in another way. Um, I, I think there's a rich history there. It just is so much of the story that to me speaks of diaspora as well. How, how something like that can just be taken out of context and reinvented in some way. Um, so I wanted to take that language, I wanted to take it and I wanted to create a story that had actual like a real meaning behind it that wasn't rooted in this idea of just trying to sell something or commodification of that kind of culture, um, but spoke of my experience of being in the world as a Chinese Canadian, Chinese diaspora, uh, here in this place at this time, effectively kind of creating or contributing to a kind of neo or nouveau uh, chinoiserie uh, of this place that reflected, you know, that kind of uniqueness of what that means of not being either or, but uh, something that's pushed through many different kinds of lenses and perspectives. And so those works when I made them, you know, that ethereality, that uh, how they came to be, they're just, you know, they're made in that way that I was telling you about, like just that, that kind of pure expression of self in that moment while holding those ideas of place and visual language in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, very, it yeah. can be a very spiritual thing too, right? Oh, yes. I think that's what's missing from something that's commodified in that way. It's just kind of appropriate and well, it's orientalist and it's exotic and right. whatever. It just will sell like hotcakes. Right. <laughs> but for me, it's it's like a deeper, it's more of a like a a truer, a, a truer kind of story, a purer kind of story. It's a yeah, it's a radical intervention that way, in that you, you know, you're getting back to without essential, you know, sort of in, in an effort to de-essentialize the image, it's like you're getting back to the essence, you know, of, of, uh, of, of these symbols and cosmologies that have been really important to, um, I guess, uh, narratives and stories in Chinese culture, um, yeah, that get really flattened through commodification. Um, so maybe we could then now talk just a little bit about the transition of day to night and night to day, you know, in in the in these two paintings, and and I see it in a lot of your paintings. These ones kind of really take it to the next level for me because they, you know, you don't know whether it could be early morning and it or it could be dusk, and uh, and I and it's amazingly achieved. And I, I wanted to know whether there, you know, this this play of light is. I feel like it's something that you that you've been working with for a long time because of these other paintings that you have made where it's just about the light, mm -hmm. like Twilight mm -hmm. Dawn, you know, right. and, and yeah, right. and, and what what struck me was like the beauty of the in between here, mm -hmm. that, that sort of how you seize and pause the transition. Is, is that, is, are, are, you know, is this light play a, a, maybe a continuation or a link to, to these ideas around the in-between, the time of in-between? Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, that like hybrid way of being and not being one or the other kind of being in-between and not, not this or that. Um, there, there is that element of, being, of that in it. Um, but for me, I am, again, I'm really interested in that, like the, that philosophical aspect of, objective and subjective, what's real or unreal, um, particularly in a, a, con a constructed space like a painting. Um, um, but just even as a way of being philosophically. Um, but so 
some of my earlier work it was you know it was about trying to reconstruct or create or construct uh, blah, 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 blah. tongue tied it's about trying to uh construct this idea of this place to give an experience for the viewer right and as the viewer moved through space it went from day to night and as it moved to night uh it, as you move through the day it becomes a bit more objective a bit more mm. uh, information is given to you and as you move towards the night uh, more is obscured and you have to pro project more of what you would imagine to be there. So then it becomes more about the subjective aspect of being. And I was really interested in trying to blur these, these lines between these two. Um, uh, like how is, you know, when you go to sleep at night and you have a dream and it's so vivid, how is that any less real in terms of your life experience than, you know, this is. It's all comes, it's all part of our life experience of being in the world, right? And I wanted to make that connection, uh, you know, between those two for the viewer as well. So uh, after doing that, I was kind of working through that idea and a few different kinds of bodies of work that day to night, that day to night. And then I started dwelling and just kind of feeling like I really wanted to dwell in this time as place this idea of time as place mm -hmm. that say something like, you know, if you could uh, dwell within that, that space as the earth spins around the sun and continually be in, in between time, how magical that would be. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how open to possibility, like anything could be possible, right? If you could imagine it like those science fiction utopian futures, if you could project, you know, those things that into those that those landscapes in that way then become even more utopic um, in that sense because it allows the viewer to dwell within that space uh -huh. well, project themselves into that space. It's super sci-fi. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, but that is exactly it. This kind of uh, uh, pausing in transition and. And you know, twilight hour, the magic hour, though that is the time of possibility. And uh, uh, it's it's a really kind of empowering um, idea, you know. And 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 um, it's strangely, even you know, through through these through these two paintings, and even twilight dawn, like the, that you know, sort of you know, that exploration um, is somehow like you know gives you the sense that things are possible um it's a yeah it's just it's, a, it's amazing how that ha you know that translation can happen i would want i could talk to you like i would want to talk so i want to talk more about things like the central country complex of china and how it situates itself as the the, the kind of moral authority on chineseness um i would want to talk more about um uh, Cantonese language and terminology and it's it's sort of supposed mirror image in uh, in Mandarin which reveals so much about the history um, of, uh, of power you know um, uh, between say Han and uh, um, uh, the, the people from the north that formed the Qing dynasty like there's so much to say. It's so in it. I'm like super into it. <laughs> We're in that time right now too, right? Like there, there's yeah. things that are critical yeah. over there. And my hearts go out to Hong Kong people for sure. Indeed. Indeed. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's, a re it, it, it's, it's incredible just how powerful um, the, the mainland is. It's, it's frightening, but and and it and it is saddening because, you know, Hong Kong is a really special and specific place, and it's and it's sad to to see, you know, things um, transform and be lost. You know, really. Yeah, I think um, I think they have strong spirit, and I think they will persevere. In one uh, yeah, yeah. I'm. I want to be. I'm with you. I'm with you in, in that. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> you just turn my doom into you know, it's like staying strong. <laughs>
Well, listen, Rick, thanks for this talk. And, and I look forward to talking to you um, later on this week. And yeah, right. thanks again for your work. And I hope to see you soon. Yeah, great questions. I wish I could be there, have these conversations in person. Next time. Next time. All right. Well, take care. Thanks, Cheryl.